Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks to the symposium for allowing me to, to present on uh, some of the work I've done around my master's. But I, I do actually work full-time for Etiquette Municipality as an ecologist, but I was thankfully given the opportunity to do some um, after-hours studying, uh, and some of my sampling was done, done during work hours, which is great. I just want to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, Rob Slotter and Jayanti Mukherjee, who are, who are uh, critical in obviously developing this work. So to get into it, I think Richard has, has spoken around the, the brief background of Etiquini Municipality, how we positioned within this uh, hotspot that he mentioned, uh, the Maputala and Pondala and Albany hotspot. And uh, something that I just want to draw your attention to, you know, we have a number of different uh, climatic conditions within our small boundary. You know, we have influences from a tropical point of view, we've got influences from subtropical and then a mist belt. So it's, it's quite a unique area that where we have a lot of endemism and, and a lot of uh, species richness. So, and if we zoom in here, you can see this is the Kazan and Wildlife Veg Map, and, and it's quite a complex system. There's a number of uh, grassland, forest, and woodland type uh, veg types that occur in there. Now, Richard and Rowan have uh, spoken about Kazan and SS, and there's a lot of work, or Kazan and Sanson Salfots, as it's formerly known. There's a lot of work that's going on, and that, that occurs in this area here, which is above the 450 meter scarp. My focus was on the floristics of the grasslands that occur in the coastal region. So this is the coastal belt here, the, the Indian Ocean coastal belt, and specifically the KZN uh, coastal belt grassland that occurs in it. Again, I'm just going to skip over this because I think Richard has already summed it up. You know, we have huge threats within, a, within an urban metro. We have a, a massive, a busy port that's driving m massive development and, and associated infrastructure. We've got freight routes, dig out ports. Um, we've also got the housing backlog that he spoke about, so a lot of areas, greenfields have been uh, turned into housing. So what has this left us with? It's, it's basically we've got these remnant patches of open space, especially in the coastal area, that sit within quite a, a dense urban matrix. So, and within them you've got a, a mosaic of grassland, woodland and forest types that's typical of that Indian Ocean coastal belt. In terms of my study, I focused on the uh, on these six here. I'm just going to quickly explain them. Treasure Beach here sits right on the coast. It sits on Berea, Berea Red uh, Geology and, and uh, um, soil type. And then uh, it's, it's been sporadically managed. We then have uh, Silver Glare Nature Reserve, New Germany Nature Reserve, and Steinbach Nature Reserve. All the rest of them, all the rest of these sites, sorry, occur on, on uh, sandstone. But uh, those three there have been uh, had, have had long-term management and long-term protection. And then we have Gibber East uh, and Sherwood. Uh, Gibber East has had sporadic management and uh, protection, and Sherwood has, until very recently, has had no protection and no management. And then we looked at Vernon Crooks as our reference site. I think Richard spoke about it being protected by Kazan and Wildlife. Um, and yeah, like I said, all of them are on sandstone except Treasure Beach, which is on Berea. So, unfortunately, 15 minutes is probably not enough time to focus on, on everything that I looked at, but broadly, my objectives were around the herbaceous species, or the forbs, and then the coastal grasslands themselves. So, in terms of the forbs, we looked at the distributional patterns, the distributional drivers, or the drivers of those, those patterns, and then we looked at modeling, or potential for modeling of these species, given that there's so little known about them. Uh, we also then... In terms of the grasslands, we looked at what, you know, what species occur within these grasslands, uh, how do we prioritize them, are they conservation importance or have we lost most of the, the, you know, the, the conservation um, value of them and then given that we're not going to meet target and I know Richard said that uh, grasslands are almost impossible to restore but uh, the fact of the matter is, is it's probably one of our only tools if we are going to seriously meet conservation targets. So we looked at how we can possibly make, make that a bit easier. Quickly on my methods. What I did is I used the Rob Scott Shaw, uh, David Stiles type method of a 100 square meter plot. So that's 10 by 10. Uh, within that, a minimum of uh, 10 1 square meter plots. And then basically bending over backwards, uh, counting or, or noting the presence of all the herbaceous species within that. And given that when I started this, I wasn't very <laughs> quite very good at IDing, uh, I had to take a photo of our specimen of each. Uh, uh, species that I thought was a new species within that plot. So it was quite arduous, a lot of photos, gigs and gigs of, of, of photos on my, on my hard drive. But uh, yeah, so and basically we sampled this, the same grass and patch until we reached a sort of leveling in terms of new species being recorded. 
So I'm going to jump straight into the results uh, given my time limitations. So across all the reserves, including Vernon Crooks, we picked up 192 species of, of forbs. So that's no grasses, just forbs. And then some of the highlights, we uh, within it, now just focusing Etiquini, not Vernon Crooks, as our, because that was our reference. If we look within a, a 10 square, uh, 100 square meter plot, we picked up, um, uh, the highest number we picked up was 31 species. And then very interestingly, and this was in uh, uh, New Germany Nature Reserve, we picked up 24 species in a one, one square meter plot, which you can see is quite rich, and you can imagine seeing that. But in the background here, you can sort of see an example of what these grasslands look like. And you've got a lot, a lot of, in between these grass and, the, and these Gerberas here, you've got a lot of small species that are, are sitting there and that, that need to be recorded. In terms of distribution of those species that we recorded, we looked here, this is obviously a cluster, uh, and I'll try and explain it to you. So we looked at the similarity of 20 and 40 percent. Now at 20 percent you've got two broad groupings, but at 20 percent you're not really seeing much. That's not a huge similarity. If we look at 40 percent, most of the groupings are actually within the reserve. So it's the plots that are within the same reserve, and in some cases, and I want to draw your attention particularly to the red uh, diamonds there, that's Giba East, which those, those two plots here have broken off and are, are not even 40% similar. And, and why I want to draw your attention to that is because they weren't that far apart from each other, and I'll show you a bit later. So exactly what is, you know, what's, you know, what's driving this, or what can we uh, look at in terms of what's determining this, this, these huge differences in species composition? So we ran an anisim, and you can see here, the long and short of it is that when we categorize all the species composition in terms of the, the different environmental factors, they all came out significantly different. But we then did a, a best correlation. And what was quite, quite key was that the, the items there in red, or those factors in red there, uh, combination of the combinations of those basically came out as the, as the 10 best. So combinations of those correlated uh, with the, uh, the species composition patterns that we noted. And, there were 10 correlations, top 10, and, all of the, and only those four, and combinations of those four, basically, were, were the highest. So it's, what, what I'm showing there, based on this picture here, is that it's altitude aspect, mean temperature, and rainfall seasonality, and they're closely linked. So if we look here, we've got the 150 meter in the blue, blue line here, and the 450 meter contour in the red. And you can see this is world clim data. Um, mean temperature is, is closely linked to those altitudinal uh, breaks. So you can see that it, it makes sense. And then to take you back to Gibi East, this is it here. This is the grass in here. We assumed it to be a single grass, in, even though there's a small scarp break on it. And uh, four plots were done at the top here, and two were done at the bottom. And that, that, that less than 40% similarity is, is a few meters apart, but it's, it's that altitudinal difference between the two, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. And then we looked at species richness, and Far and above everything else, when we did a canconical can correlation, you can see that distance to medicinal market, which was our proxy for medicinal harvesting, came out as the most significant factor determining the species resistance of a site. And uh, I know it's, it's, diff it's, it's not as good as, as obviously measuring uh, medicinal harvesting itself in terms of the uptake or the outtake, but unfortunately that's the best we could do. So it's, it's these sort of target species here, with your hypoxis, your Moola plumbeas, and your Comus autumnalis that have been removed from that systems, and uh, you're getting a drop in species richness. And then finally, I, I just want to draw your attention. So the frequency also links back to those species richness uh, differences that we noted. So this is the frequency of species that we recorded in, in, in each uh, grassland, or grassland within each reserve. So Vernon Crooks as being our reference, you can see here, it's quite a shallow graph here. There's a lot of rare species in the system. And your common species are, are frequent, but not that frequent. If I, if I then take you to Sherwood here, which is the one that hasn't been protected or managed, you can see steep graph, not as many species, not as many rare species, and your common species are very frequent. And, and you know, it links back to that removal of species from the system, a drop in species richness, opening up gaps in the system that are then being colonized by your, your most adaptable or your common species that are able to do that. So, okay, we've got, got a, a, like a sort of a picture on, on these systems and, and how, they, how diverse and rich they are, but now we, we obviously want to apply that to, to assist Etiquini municipality in terms of uh, management and protection of them. So we basically looked at two things. We looked at 
how can we prioritize these grasslands at a fine scale, given that in our systematic conservation plan they would have all come out as criti critical biodiversity areas. So we needed something that can then take it down a step uh, and say, okay, which of those critical biodiversity areas can we then work in first? And then we also looked at modeling and restoration, we'll get to. But this is basically a summary of, of, um, of what we did in terms of a, a classical conservation assessment. So, we, you know, systematic conservation planning is, is, is definitely the buzzword at the moment. But we took it back to stuff that's been done in the, in the mid-20th uh, century around, you know, looking at the species' traits, their, their threats, and their ge uh, geographic distribution, and... and applying a standardized score to that. So obviously looking at the frequency data, if we had a, a species that was infrequent at both a reserve and a plot, a plot scale, we would give it quite a high score. Um, so obviously something that's yeah, like that, that's red listed and endemic is going to get a higher score than something that's common, not red listed and, and not endemic. And uh, so yeah, every species was then scored and had a total score. We then, for each reserve, we looked at what was present in that reserve and we added all those scores together. We got a total score for each reserve. And again, Vernon Crooks, as I referenced, you can see scored the highest. Um, but then we, if we look at the Etiquini reserves, we've got New Germany and Silver Glen, which were under long-term protection and management, which are then coming up next in the list. And then we've got Giba East, Stanbank, and Treasure Beach grouped together in the 800 scoring. And then, unfortunately, Sherwood is, is quite low there. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to Stanbank here, which has been under long-term uh, protection and management. But... Unfortunately, it's one of the few reserves that's got grazers, uh, that's got zebra in it, that obviously graze, and uh, linking back to Rob Scott Shaw's paper and Morris's paper around the impacts of grazing, even at moderate levels, I suspect that that's the reason why this, this grass, these grasslands in this reserve are not as good as they could be. And then finally, uh, the, uh, mod well not finally, but modeling and then restoration. So we've seen a correlation between aspect and altitude and the associated climatic conditions and uh, and with species composition but that doesn't necessarily tell us that they they ecologically unique uh, assemblages species assemblages so what we did is we then took those and categorized them or we took the categorized assemblages and we ran them again or we compared them against null models um, which is a statistical pro process and what we found is both the aspect and altitude uh, uh, composition, species compositions, were significantly different to just a randomized grouping of species. So that shows that there are ecological processes su such as competition and resource use that are driving these specific assemblages. Knowing that, we then map them out across the entire city. So you can see these are examples of the aspect mapping. Um, and you, you can see there are quite a few different aspect types that are occurring in, in quite a small area. So what that does is, uh, to try and explain it, is basically uh, these are different polygons, and if you click on it, it'll tell you what the altitude category and what the aspect category of that particular area is. And uh, you can then link that to the, to the corresponding list of species and the associated frequencies. So that's got two uses. You can basically use that to then model across the whole city and, and get an idea of where you think species are going to occur or most likely to occur. But also in terms of restoration, if, you, if you're looking to do a like-for-like like restoration, you want to try and mimic this high biodiversity that these systems have. And by pl using different planting palettes uh, that are guided by this aspect categories or the altitude categories, you're then recreating that biodiversity within the system. So I'm going to just broadly look at what, we, what we've looked at. In terms of hotspot conservation, so we know it's located in a hotspot. These systems are small and they're fragmented. Some of them are only a few hectares in size, but they are still very important. They have a lot of red data and endemic species within them. And you can see that they're very unique in their species composition. So urban areas still have an important role to play in terms of the global conservation context. Um, site prioritization, again, I spoke about it. Small patch size can be, still be of conservation importance, but also we mustn't just get rid of classical conservation assessments, systematic conservation planning can work together with them to obviously do a broad scale and fine scale conservation uh, prioritization. Management um, links to the species richness. We need to, threat management is critical. You can see that there's a direct link between management uh, uh, time and, and obviously the, the quality of those grasslands. And then finally, in terms of conservation planning, a systematic conservation planning, if we're going to use target-based um, conservation, uh, target -based conservation uh, uh, strategies, you know, these systems have very high beta diversity within them. To try and select 
well, for the, in this case, 25% of them that are representative of the entire system is extremely difficult. You can see they've just within the same grass and patch, you're getting huge variance in, in uh, a species composition. Now, how do I select 25% of that that's then going to be representative? So, very difficult and something that needs to be looked at. And then finally, it's not on my slide, but climate change, I've shown you that composition is linked to climate, uh, climate factors. It's important that we, we think uh, about climate change and how we're going to, and I think Rowan started by looking at those sort of impacts, those specific Im impacts of species, and we need to do that. Um, we need to continue doing that and maybe look at it at a, at a grass and scale. So just not only species, but at grass and level as well. Thank you.